Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mark's Q&A here at the Ubuntu Online Summit. Uh, if you're familiar with these, then uh, I probably don't need to tell you. But if you're new, the way this works is we're going to take questions over IRC. We are in the channel hash Ubuntu hyphen UOS hyphen plenary. You start your word question in all capital letters, and we'll get a nice highlight. And we're going to pick them out and uh, ask them of Mark as we get through them. Uh, but first, Mark has got uh, some slides that he wanted to share with us. Yes, hello, everybody. It's great uh, to be back. Looking forward to your questions. Um, fire them away on IRC. Um, let me just uh, kick this off as a preliminary couple of thoughts um, on where we're at and what's kicking around. I hope your online summit is going really well. I was at the uh, OpenStack Summit uh, last week, and of course, the OpenStack Summit is essentially uh, in many senses, it was an outgrowth of the old Ubuntu Developer Summit, the in-person summit. Um, and uh, uh, there are clearly growing pains, growth pains at the OpenStack Summit, just in terms of their ability to handle the number of parallel conversations and the detail of those conversations and balance you know, the, the, the number of voices around the table and so on. So um, I was arguing quite strongly in favor of OpenStack following Ubuntu again uh, online and, and adopting this kind of uh, virtual format, which I think leads to more thoughtful participation in the right topics by the right people. Uh, so I hope you're having a good week, and I'm very happy to, to, to join you. Um, Michael, do you, have, uh, do you have that shared screen up? Yep, it should be up. Great. All right, so first of all, uh, congratulations, everybody, on what I think is an outstanding LTS release, uh, 1604. Um, and I say that, I think, from both perspectives. As I look at uh, around the community, I think there were lots of um, communities, parts of Ubuntu, that really put effort into 1604. I think people realize that the LTS releases are, are what everybody else actually uses on in the long term. And so they're a great opportunity to get your stuff um, baked and celebrated and adopted. Uh, so I want to celebrate a bunch of the new uh, teams that came in and did that work. Um, uh, the Ubuntu Mate community, I think, uh, is, is, has done an outstanding job and is a great um, example of new um, innovation and energy in, in Ubuntu. Um, but again, I think all of the flavors really took advantage of the 1604. Uh, from the canonical uh, perspective, we were super proud to get um, the various 2.0s, MAZ 2.0, LexD 2.0, Juju 2.0, into 1604. We're still shaking out, I think, all of the um, kinks up to the 0.1 release, which is where we, we typically see adoption um, accelerate. So for everybody who's um, who's part of that, let's keep our heads down. Um, uh, uh, SRUing uh, and addressing issues in the LTS through to the point release, um, and uh, and congratulations again on that. Uh, I want to welcome the new tech board. Um, thank you to the developers um, for uh, participating in that election. Um, it's a tremendous um, testament, I think, uh, to the importance of the project that we have such. Um, thoughtful and insightful people who put themselves forward for um, for that process. I want to thank everybody who stood. Um, it was a great uh, uh, shortlist, effectively, of candidates. Um, and I want to thank um, the folks who stepped down um, at the at the end of their terms. Um, I couldn't be more confident in the quality of thinking and the quality of the discussion and the decisiveness uh, of that group. Um, uh, we continue to grow, and I'm very excited that we're starting the cycle with uh, with new projects out there that are thinking about joining Ubuntu. It is fun and exciting and fresh, uh, and I bet there'll be more. I want to double down on the invitation to folks to to join Ubuntu and express your individual ideas about what Linux should be about um, under this banner. And um, if there's anything we can do to support that, either at the community council level or the tech board level, or from canonical side of things, please um, feel free to, to ask. Um, so two big things changed in 1604 from the point of view of every single instance of 1604, every desktop, every laptop, every VM. And one of them is this, is Snappy. Now, we are just at the beginning of the Snappy journey. Uh, we're just starting to see what people will do with Snaps. I don't want to um, um, overpromise, um, but I do think they are a very important new primitive. 
they're a way to essentially deliver a complete set of software with all of its dependencies. And you can think about that lots of different ways. You can think about that as a great new mechanism to deliver apps to the desktop. You can think of that as a great new mechanism to deliver apps to the cloud. You can think of that as a great new way to just to deliver content, you know, your, your website to your web servers effectively could be delivered as a snap. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done, but I'm super proud of how these first pieces have shaken out. In 1604, we got real transactionality, we got real um, performance in the way these uh, you know, updates and upgrades happen because of the way we're doing it. I think you'll see that lots of other distros are gonna follow. Um, we already see signs of, of, of other groups that are sort of have made similar, outlined similar goals, now starting to follow the way we're doing um, uh, snaps. It's kind of a pity that we will continue to see fragmentation, but I think that's inevitable, that's human nature. And I'm quite proud of the fact that we're confident leading and quite proud of the way we are leading all of that. Anyway, that's a long way of saying um, uh, have fun with Snappy. Um, Snapcraft, which is the build tool, um, is super easy and super user, useful, and there's a nice ecosystem um, f forming of parts, what we call parts, um, which are essentially uh, uh, source code that's been um, described well enough that you can easily pull it into your snap. Um, uh, the last thing I want to talk about is LexD. I hope you guys are playing with it and having fun with it. It is the world's fastest hypervisor, and uh, you'd be pretty amazed at who's using it and how they're using it, but I think um, this is going to be the new hypervisor that makes a big difference. Um, on your laptop, it gives you essentially a cloud on your laptop, pretty much as many little machines as you want uh, of any Linux flavor and very fast. Um, uh, and in large scale environments, it essentially is a new way to think about OpenStack or Mesosphere or Docker, um, essentially like operating at scale. Um, so that's it. I hope we have some good questions flowing in. And um, uh, with that, Michael, back to you. All right, it does look like we've had a whole bunch of questions come in. So uh, keep asking them and we will get through as many of them as we can. Uh, the first one is from Aurora Avenue, who's asking, uh, says uh, at LeWeb, you said that microstates like the Isle of Man could lead the way in cloud storage legislation. What did you mean by this exactly? Well, I think we have a, a real interesting set of questions in society about data, access to data, and governance of data. Um, I think in the smaller states, it's easier to, to set principled positions in that regard. Um, so for example, I think th there is a, a set of rules out there which everybody would consider are fair and reasonable, governing, for example, how authorities can get access to private data, how they get access to company data, and so on. Um, I think it would be dangerous to, to take a black and white view of that, to say, um, you know, private data is totally private, uh, or sorry, corporate data is totally private. Um, but I also think, you know, in some of the larger jurisdictions in the world, in the US in particular, um, there, are, there appear to be lots of ways where data can be grabbed in ways that I think are unacceptable. Uh, I would like to see countries taking a position on that, trying to find that middle line. Um, and I think smaller countries, in smaller countries, it's easy for them, easier for them to, to be thoughtful about that, right? So um, while we haven't seen it yet, I do think um, uh, it's a hot topic. There has just been a data protection, um, sort of uh, a bunch of data protection work that's landed from the European Commission. I'm a big fan of Europe, um, and I think uh, that will be an important body of work. But, but, but being large, they go slower than some of the smaller countries possibly can go. All right, the next one is from McPhail. He says, uh, congratulations on making Ubuntu an innovative and exciting platform for development. Is there a plan to fully and comprehensively document the SDK, Mir, and Snappy? Just now the documentation is not as good as competing products. Yes, I think that's a fair comment. Um, the, the focus for us in the push to 1604 has been to get the basics in place. Um, and I'm very, I, I think it's great feedback that the documentation doesn't reflect everything that's there. Uh, now I think we need to go a little slower and because we're in a stable release, that's natural. Um, and we need to do a better job of documenting those pieces. Um, I hope that the SDK team is doing a good job of that. Michael, maybe you can comment. 
Um, but I definitely understand that the snappy guys have been kind of flat flat out trying to get to the 1604 milestone, and we can expect them to, 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 to go more carefully and slowly going forward. Yeah, we are keeping up on the SDK documentation pretty well. Uh, the, the toolkits behind that and the services are uh, evolving pretty fast still, so it's a constant game of catch up. All right, uh, the next one is from Jan says, do you see Ubuntu for phones entering the conventional retail space, like brick and mortar stores, within the next 12 months? Um, I don't want to comment on timelines. We do see it getting there. Um, we're also pretty focused on, on slowly expanding the set of hands to which Ubuntu is easily available, because we know that we're on a, on a curve, and as we, as we move up that curve in terms of the completeness and the fit and finish and polish of the experience and of the product, it becomes relevant for uh, a wider audience. So, so there's always a temptation to sort of go, you know, straight for the moonshot. But the problem is, if you miss a moonshot, it's pretty fatal. So, um, um, we know, for example, that there are carriers who want to put us in retail stores in some pretty big markets. We've actually held back from that specifically because we don't think the product is ready for that level of audience. Uh, right now, my focus is on generalizing the phone and tablet experience into a PC experience so that I and you and many of us can actually run Unity 8 on our desktops. We run exactly the same code that you would get on a phone or a tablet, but we're really exercising the desktop experience. We're not quite there yet. I'm waiting for the signal from the desktop team to say that it's, it's, it's um, um, good enough for you know, the advanced guard to arrive. Um, and the reason that's my focus is just because there are so many more of us who use Linux on a open Linux on a, on a laptop than are going to use it on, on a phone. Um, the next step from there is to get to a, an all snap version of that laptop. And that has some real benefits. At that point, we really have uh, a, a much better handle on security because we, we won't need X or we'll be putting X in a box. And so, you know, it, it goes in the same box as the app that it, that it came with. Um, uh, and and then I think we, we we can make that final push to full retail exposure because we'll have a really great convergence story, we'll have a really great security story, we'll have a really great update story, and I think we'll have something that you know is pretty unique in the world. Um, now that may sound like a sort of very measured process, but I think it's important for us to do this carefully, right? You don't have to look very far to find people who've aimed too high and fallen flat. All right, so uh, kind of along the same veins, we've got two different questions. Uh, one's asking where you see the Ubuntu five years from now, and the other is what major technological innovations are you hoping to see in the next 10 years? Sure. Um, well, at the moment, I, I think we see three pretty distinct um, fields of computing. Um, we see the um, uh, personal computing, which is initially defined by the PC, then mobile, we think that's going to converge. We see cloud computing, which is pretty much the evolution of the data center. Uh, and then we see this new field emerging, which is, you can call it the distributed cloud. Um, it's more like a million pieces of glass. Um, it, you know, Think of all the, the boxes on the wall controlling your lighting, controlling air conditioning, controlling the network, access to the network, top of rack switches, all the way through to um, uh, home security, robots, drones, self-driving cars, and so on. In a sense, each of those things is a little server, a little Linux server. But the tricky thing about them is they're not all in one data center being managed professionally. They're, they're, they're spread out all over the world. And that's that new thing that people call IoT. It, I'm not sure exactly what the right label for it is. So three big domains of computing. Right now, about two thirds of cloud computing runs Ubuntu, and I think that's great. You know, I think it's, that's a healthy situation. I think there's a there's a lead platform that everybody knows, and then there's other platforms that people sometimes have reason to use, and I think that's great. That's competition. That's healthy. I think we can achieve the same two thirds um, leadership in IoT, right? Uh, and that's an incredible thing. That's that's the new big wave of computing. Uh, that's essentially thinking about making your home router software defined as a snappy device, making your top of rack switch software defined as a snappy switch where you run apps, making Wi-Fi access points and all sorts of 
um, robots and drones and cars and things like that into snappy devices that you can build software for and you can manage much more easily than you currently can manage the firmware on that class of stuff, right? So I think that's a huge focus for us right now. I'm pretty sure that in five years' time, we'll be two-thirds of that market, um, which is great. It's great for Ubuntu developers. They'll be able to write new apps for that whole class of things just as easily as they write apps for the cloud today. And then personal computing, well, that's a wild card. I don't think Ubuntu on the phone is going to, to you know, be a lead product just because that phone market is already defined, right? But I do think personal computing will be disrupted again. And if we're lucky, if we're in the right place at the right time with the right community, then, and we have that convergence story behind us, then I think we could be the lead for the next wave of personal computing. Just exactly what that might be, I don't want to speculate about right now because my focus is on the, the, um, the IoT side of things. But, um, but that's why I think it's important for us to get the convergence piece right and stay in personal computing because it will be disrupted once again. All right. Aria is asking, will we see Ubuntu Software Center rebuild to allow Snappy and also things like Google Chrome and paid apps? Uh, very simply, yes. Um, we want to have a single uh, front end to all of the different ways you can get apps effectively from, uh, from the Ubuntu community, from Canonical, from, from third parties. Um, uh, the software center is supposed to be that central GUI to do it. Um, the, the shift to using um, GNOME software, to being aligned with GNOME software, I think was helpful. Um, it's obviously not a perfect piece of software, um, but we, I think it was a useful shift to keep us focused on the key things that we need to get right. All right, the next one is from Chloe Wolfie Girl. She's asking, uh, what do you think about the HUD and how would you like it to be integrated into Unity 8? Uh, that's a super interesting question. I think, I think the HUD r remains a really interesting piece of conceptual work, right? How do you get access to rich functionality without having to pointy clicky your way through a complex set of, um, set of menus? Um, as I look around the sort of world of personal computing, we see a lot of people thinking about natural language interfaces, right? And the HUD, I think, fits into that realm of things. It's trying to find a more human and direct imperative way of getting access to stuff. Right now, it's not a, not a top priority for me. I think we have other things that we need to clean up in Unity 8 in the convergence story. If you have ideas on that, then, then, then crack on. And uh, I'd love to see what people do. All right. Amar wants to know how you plan on topping this year's MWC. <laughs> we did have an incredible MWC. And, um, and we saw that on all fronts. You know, we, our stand kind of had uh, phones and tablets down the one side of it. It had um, uh, cloud and cloud infrastructure down the, the other side of it, and then IoT. And um, um, if you think of, just put yourself in the shoes of your national telco, your, le your, your local telco. Um, while the very sort of visible part of that telco is the phone, and everyone sort of says, well, you know, the phone and Ubuntu on the phone is interesting and important. How are you doing there? I just want you to think about the rest of that infrastructure for a while. Most telcos are moving their data centers, like their exchanges and their core data centers, to be clouds. And almost all of them are building those clouds on Ubuntu. Deutsche Telekom, AT&T, uh, NTT, uh, Bell Canada, um, Verizon, um, you name them, they're moving to Ubuntu for those clouds. So that's the heart of the telco. And then think about all of the edge pieces of infrastructure, all the towers, the cell phone towers, the stuff driving those antennas, the top of rack switches, the routers, the, the, the DSL gateways, the home gateways. There are more of those than there are phones. And m many of those, I think, will move to Snappy, right, to Ubuntu again. Uh, and then there's that last piece of that infrastructure, the human piece, the personal computing side of things. Um, uh, I think we could do something really interesting there. But I just want you to appreciate for a minute just how much of that telco picture now Ubuntu is really relevant for and how exciting that is for them, for us, for the developer community um, and for, for people who work in that industry. Um, so that was pretty exciting. What could we do next year that might top it? Um, well, I definitely think we'll see huge growth in the IoT side of things. It's the hot thing. Ubuntu is there, and it's the right platform. It's the thing that everybody's using to innovate. Um, uh, I think we'll see more and more real production stories of people with millions of robots or cars or drones or 
um, GSM base stations or software-defined radios of one form or another. Um, and that will sort of go from the proof of concept phase to the real in production at scale phase. Um, and who knows what happens on personal computing? Um, and like I said, we do have folks who want to put us in the retail store. Um, we just want to be thoughtful about when the product is ready for that widespread uh, visibility. All right. Uh, Ario again says the content of your recent talks and interviews seem to be largely focused on cloud and server computing. Are you still as passionate about Ubuntu in the personal computing space as you were when you started the project? Yes, I think for two reasons. First, you know, we can we can joke about the 1%, right? When most people talk about the 1%, they mean something different. But when I talk about the 1%, I mean people who are passionate about free software on their personal devices. And I think that's an enormously important audience, right? Uh, whether you come to that because of security, whether you come to that because of economics, whether you come to that because of freedom, whether you come to that because you're a developer and that's what you want to use every day, um, you're a VIP as far as I'm concerned, right? I have been incredibly lucky in life in, in no small part because of the activities of a huge community of people who work on free software every day. And so kind of making sure that we have a great personal computing story for them is, I think, an important thing for me to, to do. And there are other people at Canonical and in the Ubuntu community who share that um, mission. And, and so we work together to get it done. That hasn't changed at all. Um, there is that outside chance that we could be part of the next wave of personal computing and actually move right to the mainstream. But that's only part of my motivation for, for, for being there. That explains Unity 8, right? I really do believe that the future of personal computing is fully converged, and nobody else is going to build that as free software unless we build it as free software. So controversy be damned, that's what we're doing. Um, but I, I'm delighted that Ubuntu creates a forum for all the different desktop environments to, to, to do their thing and do it in a way that end users can consume and consume reliably and securely. I think that's important. Um, I have been talking a lot about cloud and infrastructure because it is important, right? It's important that um, uh, if you want Ubuntu to have a future, there has to be a sustainable story around that. And right now, it's it's pretty exciting in that regard to see the level of adoption of Ubuntu inside everyday businesses, big and small. Uh, and in particular, that's being driven by the move to cloud computing, you know, both on the public cloud um, and uh, and with OpenStack and, and other private cloud infrastructures. Um, uh, so that's why I'm excited about it. I think it's important to us. I think we are defining the state of the art. You know, if you look at Juju, if you look at LexD, I think these are critical primitives for large-scale computing. Um, and they wouldn't happen if it wasn't for Canonical, if it wasn't for the Ubuntu community, if it wasn't for me kind of, you know, being willing to get out front of that. So, um, so I'm pretty proud of that work, and it's topical right now. In fact, most of my thinking at the moment is going into Snappy. Um, uh, I think, you know, the cloud story really evolved five, six years ago. We started to think about computing at scale and how the operating system needed to change and the tooling that was needed to support that. Um, Juju, LexD, those things really, we conceptualized those five years ago and they're now bearing fruit. Snappy today is in that early, early stage. And so for me personally, it's, it's the blank canvas, right? It's the really interesting stuff where nobody's ever done anything like this before and we have to figure out kind of first, from first principles, what's going to work, what's going to be important. I think the key problems in that distributed computing story are security, right? Security from lots of angles. You have got to be able to update your home router for a glibc floor or an open SSL floor, and that's got to happen automatically without you thinking about it. It's got to happen without you having to go find the firmware and download it and flash it and cross your fingers and, you know, sacrifice a goat under the full moon, right? It's got to be just work, just be reliable. Um, also, for that really to reach its full potential, we have to add apps, and those apps are going to be untrusted, right? We have to add apps from all over the world to your home router. So how do we put those in a box? How do we, how do we make those really secure? And then the, the cost of managing those devices has to really go down. Imagine you're a university and you've got 3,000 access points and they're going to run Ubuntu. Well, that's great, but if you need four system administrators to run 3,000 servers 
right? That's a lot of money just to keep your Wi-Fi access networking. That's not going to work. So thinking about the costs of managing millions of drones, millions of robots, millions of things, doorknobs, fireplaces, HVAC systems, access control systems, keeping that cost really clean and lean and manageable for every home or for every business, that's a really interesting problem. And so all of those things come together for me inside Snappy. Right? All right, kind of related to the previous question, uh, Kassiara saying, I'm very excited for Ubuntu phone, tablet, and the new Unity 8 desktop. What's the priority of the new Unity 8 compared to server and hypervisor? I'm a fan of Snappy, but would like to see the new 1610 with Unity 8. Right. Um, well, you will be able to get 1610 with Unity 8, just like you can get 1604 with, with a Mate uh, or, or KDE or GNOME, right? Um, it'll be there, it'll be an option, and the team that's working on that is committed to making that a first-class option. You ask, you know, what's the priority? For about 80 people, that is their top priority, right? That is what they're focused on, that's all the piece they're working on, juggling all the pieces to get that into, into a fit state. Um, uh, for the people working on cloud, it's not a priority at all. And we kind of have to be that way. We have to separate our areas of interest so that we can have teams who just worry about doing one thing really, really well. For the Unity 8 and the desktop team, that's their top priority, right? We know that we have a big community that will lead KDE, that will lead GNOME. Um, uh, I'm, you know, I'm super confident in their work. We're focused on Unity 8 and the Unity 8 community is focused on Unity 8 and that's their top priority. Um, I want to be running Unity 8 as my desktop for 1610. I'm pretty sure that's going to be a brittle and ropey experience, right? Just it's going to be a 1.0, brand new desktop environment, brand new story. Um, I'm also pretty sure it'll clean up really quickly. Um, what the exact timelines on that are, difficult to tell. I have said publicly, I'd like the community to tell us that, 60, that, that Unity 8 is ready to be the default Ubuntu experience. I think I made a mistake because I was so convinced in the convergence story moving Unity 7 into position before it was, before it was ready uh, in 11.04. So lessons learned. And I think the right way to deal with that is to make a great Unity 8 desktop, use it ourselves, and then let people vote essentially and, and signal that, that this is what we want as the default Unity for Ubuntu. All right. Changing gears a little bit, we've got uh, three questions about your previous adventures as a cosmonaut. Uh, would you visit space again in the future? What was your favorite memory of Mir? And was going to space more exciting or more scary? It's interesting. Do you know my favorite memories all have to do with people? Um, funny things people said, stupid things that happened, mistakes, you know, that we can laugh about now, but which maybe we wouldn't have laughed about. Um, yeah, probably not so funny when they <laughs> happened. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, I remember very clearly there was an experiment where they had some, some, I think it was wheatgrass growing, and like all I wanted to do for 10 days was go make a crop circle, um, but, but I didn't. Um, the, the, there was one moment where I kind of woke up in the middle of the night. Night is an odd concept, right? You have your six hours where you're supposed to be asleep, but outside it's like day, night, day, night, day, night, as you go around the earth. Anyway, I woke up in the dark at night, and uh, looked out of the window. And as I looked out of the window, there were these eyeballs on the other side of the window. And it took me about half a second to realize that it was sort of internal reflection from one of the, one of the many panes of glass. But I, I, literally, I looked out the window, and there was someone looking back at me. I shot myself um, briefly. So I have those sorts of funny memories of that. Um, I, I remember the time in Russia very, you know, very fondly. It was a great adventure. Lots of really interesting guys. The cosmonaut community, the space community in Star City is very close knit, lovely people, um, and a great and a great great time. Um, would I like to go back? Hell yes! But I'd like to go a little further than low Earth orbit. And there are other fine people working on making that possible. So why don't we stay focused on free software? All right. Welcome back to that then. Uh, Chloe is asking, when will you use Unity 8 on your desktop? Also, do you use Ubuntu on the phone daily or do you still use alternatives like iOS and Android for apps? I still use, I still use alternatives. I'm um, using Ubuntu on a tablet more now, the Unity 8 on a tablet. Um, and I really want to get it on my desktop. It, I was told it wasn't going to be ready for 1604. And for good reason, I didn't really want to press 
press the team, given that 1604 is going to be used by so many people in so many desktop environments, I thought it was right that we gave the team flexibility, use their judgments to how much effort they put into Unity 8 versus the infrastructure that everybody depends on, right? GNOME, KDE, and so on. So I thought that was the right call. Now I'm all about Unity 8. I want Unity 8 on my laptop. I expect I'll get it during 1610. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, I, I think a bunch of people will be using it for 1610. How fast it cleans up and spreads beyond there is kind of up to us, right? Up to the community. Um, um, how, how much we swarm around that problem and make it work for each of us individually is a function of how quickly it will become useful for, for the community at large. All right. Mushrooms Michael, is asking... You're, you're slightly in the middle of that. What, what's your view on, on Unity 8 as a, as a desktop ISO? Um, it's recently gotten to where I can actually start playing around with it. Um, getting uh, Hangouts working in the browser is probably one of the biggest steps for me uh, to be able to start using it more full time. So I've been using the Ubuntu web browser as my primary for several months now, and it's working out really well. So there's only a few apps really that I need that aren't going to run natively on Unity 8 just yet. So I'm looking forward to it maybe after the online summit's over, I'll have some more time to play with it. Right. Well, that's a good answer. Um, and it is it is available as a, a session you can install on 16.04 already. So you don't, if anyone's interested in trying it out, you don't have to wait until 16.10 to do that. So I, I did just get my, my new XPS 15, which is absolutely amazing. Loving it. Um, and so that's what I intend to, to get Unity 8 up and running on. Uh, not because it needs those kinds of PC resources. That's so that I can run clouds on a laptop. But um, but as part of the install for that, I um, w went digging around looking for it, f Unity 8 on 1604 and was told I'm not quite ready yet. Um, but I will move to it as soon as I can. Yeah. So I'm still on a Lenovo X220. So I don't have a touch screen. I'm looking forward to seeing just how exactly. well Unity 8 works without touch input. All right, uh, the next question is from Mushrooms. He's asking, will we see Ubuntu branded hardware on Ubuntu store, like home routers, mice, shirts, et cetera? Um, I think the great thing about Ubuntu is that it enables people to go pursue their interests. Um, and, it, and, and we're more effective as that enabler than trying to crowd them out. Um, I love that we have people who use Ubuntu to deliver great devices from laptops, System76, um, through um, uh, with, with Ubuntu Core, I imagine, a huge range of devices, uh, smart screens, robots, drones, um, you know, all kinds of things that are going to become important to us. Um, I don't think I don't think it helps to split Canonical's attention down to the level of individual um, devices, right? Um, you know, if I look at top of rack switches, there are a whole bunch of top of rack switches from a bunch of different vendors that are now starting to use Ubuntu Core, snappy Ubuntu effectively, as their base operating system. And it allows them to compete on the hardware. It allows software developers to essentially deliver applications that can run on any of those switches. That's a pretty incredible thing, and, and, and I think we're best focused on, you know, staying in that enablement um, role. I will add, though, if you want shirts, we do have those already. You can get those from our online store. Uh, in fact, I'm wearing one right now. Uh, let's see, Seb, Seb, Seb asks, what's your favorite open source event not including anything Ubuntu specific? So I went to scale. Um, and for the first time, and that was a that was a pretty lovely event. Um, a nice mix of pure ops, pure dev, pure you know corporate, but all in balance. It felt like the the companies were there, but they they were wearing t-shirts, not collared shirts, effectively. Um, and I thought that was very cool. I, Facebook was there, for example, with their open switches, which I thought was. Pretty, pretty interesting. Um, Rackspace was there talking about their work with containers and power, which is which is pretty interesting. Um, uh, I'm told that All Things Open is a phenomenal event, but I've never had the the, the opportunity to go. Um, 
can't tell you much more beyond that. I, I enjoy kind of some of the smaller events too, the meetups. Uh, I think they're quite fun. All right. Mick Fail says uh, that DeepMind has been given access to millions of patient records in the NHS. Is free and open source software lagging behind the curve in healthcare? Do you have ambitions to change that situation? Super interesting. Um, so stepping back a little bit, I think machine learning and deep learning, which is essentially um, uh, trying to extract information from data the way the brain extracts information from experience, um, is a very powerful new idea. Um, I, I like that increasingly that's moving out of the companies behind it, like Google and Microsoft and Facebook, and into the open. Um, so you know, people are actually open sourcing important work that they've done, and I think we can be grateful. You know, Google led the way there. Um, I see Facebook and and Microsoft and others doing the same effectively. Um, uh, the machine learning, deep learning, AI story is 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 kind of a profound moment in our history because we are genuinely going to create intelligence that exceeds our own. It is going to happen. It's going to happen far faster than you might realize. And I think the fact that it's happening in the open is for the best. Um, it's still a scary and um, profound moment, but I think it's good that it's happening increasingly in the open. Um, I think we need to, we can, this is something we as a community could do. Um, we could essentially um, take those tools which are kind of difficult and Baroque to use and we could bring that Ubuntu magic to them, right? How do I enable a researcher in any university to spin up a deep learning um, uh, infrastructure with any of these open tools from any of these vendors? That would be a cool thing to work on. The right attack line for that I think is Juju Charms. There are already charms of much of the big data infrastructure um, a, a Hadoop, um, a Spark, as well as some of the sort of compute-oriented stuff that would fit there, like Mesosphere. Um, so that would be a fun thing if you're interested in this to participate in. You're really focused then on enabling anybody to participate in the machine learning revolution. Um, and I think that would be valuable and important work. Oh, Michael, you may be muted. Yes. Um, a couple of people want to know where you get all of the ideas for animal names for all the Ubuntu releases. And then Chloe also wants to know if all of them were to fight each other, which one would win? <laughs> um, the, the, the honest truth is Google and a dictionary. I used, I used to spend a weekend literally reading a dictionary. Um, now there are search tools that let me zone in on a, on a, on a subset. Um, and uh, there's a fairly sort of feverish market um, for for suggestions on um, on various wiki pages on the Ubuntu wiki that I always consult, Yakety Yak was a direct um, suggestion from uh, Z, um, but. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll keep that as a surprise for, uh, for two years' time. Again, Michael, I think you're... Sorry, yeah, we lost you for part of that answer, I think, or at least I did. That, um, that, that might have been, been the... I, I Google a lot and use a dictionary. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, Amar is asking... Um, what will the naming scheme be after 1610? Though I think he actually means after uh, Z in 1704. Yeah. Right. Um, let's leave that as a surprise for 1710, shall we? We've never actually had an A release, though, have we? We have not. All right. Uh, Seb 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 wants to know what happened to Ubuntu TV, and Ubuntu Fun wants to know if it's still something that we plan to do. Um, so what happened was that we did enough work to be comfortable that the baseline of the experience was there, but we couldn't find a TV manufacturer who wanted to put a powerful enough chip into the TV. At the time, the smart TVs that were being made were really, they were putting the weakest possible chip into the TV. 
And so we had to take a tactical decision, and we realized that there just aren't that many TVs made in the world. You know, it would be um, of the various personal computing form factors, it would be the one that would get the the, the lowest path to a sort of volume widespread adoption. So we, we paused it. I remain convinced that the full convergence story is necessary. Like we want to have full convergence across you know, everything, including the TV experience. So I'd love to have, you know, if, if you're interested in that, I'd love to see Unity 8 having a community that's driving it towards a great experience with a, with a, with a pointer effectively with a remote control. Um, I do think that the most important of the full convergence spectrum, the you know the phone, tablet, PC threesome is the one that we should be focused on, um, and so I'm really glad that's where we are working. But I, to my mind, that the big screen effectively remains interesting. There will be others as well, but I don't really want to go into that until we've until we've got the big three. All right. Well, speaking of that, Mario Grip wants to know if we're going to get an Ubuntu watch. No, I don't think so. I think that the watch is, is fundamentally a companion device. It's likely to be um, uh, um, best done as a dedicated device experience effectively, um, which I think is consistent with what we've seen elsewhere. Um, uh, so my, my gut feel is no. Now, having said that, you may well see watches that run Ubuntu. Uh, but they would be using Ubuntu Core, and they'd be using um, Mir as a as a graphics layer, effectively within a dedicated UI for that device. Ubuntu Core is small enough to run on a watch, and in fact, there there have in, there have been watches from fairly big brands that you've seen up on stage that were actually running Ubuntu Core under the hood. Um, uh, when one of those goes to production would be difficult for me to say, but it wouldn't be Unity 8. It wouldn't be part of that, that, that convergence experience. I think you know, that's too specialized a piece to fit into that big picture. All right. Just Caracas has kind of uh, an open-ended question. He says, can you tell us something we don't know already? <laughs> Uh, I almost certainly. I'm just not sure why you'd be that interested. <laughs> Hoping for some secret nugget, probably. No, you right. know, one of the difficulties of working in the open is that there aren't that many secret nuggets, right? And usually, we keep a secret because it's somebody else's secret that we that we're priv privy to. Um, um, I think there have been some pretty stunning twists and turns in the big picture of the journey of free software. Um, Ubuntu on Windows, the native Ubuntu environment on Windows. I think it's a pretty fantastic um, step. I think it's pretty fantastic for our community that you know you can now share skills, ideas, tools, trips, uh, tricks, uh, traps um, to a whole new audience, um, which I think is very very interesting. Um, uh, I think it's testament to Linus and the kernel team that they present such a crisp interface that it's been possible to essentially substitute that with a Windows driver. Uh, and I think it's testament to the Microsoft engineering that, they've, that, they, that they both saw that as valuable and important and have been able to do a pretty amazing job of it. So being part of that was very exciting and was briefly a, a secret that we, that we needed to keep. Uh, but, but there isn't very much in that regard. All right, uh, Jan is asking, what is your wave one moment for the Ubuntu project? Wave one, meaning? No, wave one. So is something happening. You're like, oh, we finally made it. We won. Oh, we've won. Um, what a very, very, very long time ago, um, smart people started saying thank you for how Ubuntu was making a difference for them. And I mean, people like um, teachers, people like entrepreneurs, um, people running pretty big businesses. And, you know, I don't know that that's a we've won moment, but it's definitely a I'm glad we're doing it moment, right? Um, and, you know, there are lots of reasons, I think, for us to be proud of what we do and the way we do it. Um, I think the danger of, a we've won moment is that 
it doesn't really reflect what's actually going on. What's actually going on is that the whole world is moving to increasingly open ways of working at everything. And we happen to be playing a good role, I think, as the, as the deliverer of a lot of that goodness. When we say we've won, it's sort of, it's a little bit like concentrating our attention too much on who might have lost, and that's not interesting. And it also perhaps is taking a little too much credit for everything that's happening, right? Um, we shouldn't be shy about what we do. We take care of an incredible amount of stuff that is important, and it, and it innate, gets rid of friction for other people. And we also lead on a, on a bunch of key things. But in total, we're part of a much bigger movement. Um, and uh, you know, we have history on our side, I think. OK, the next one is from Lugarius. It's asking, is it possible that Ubuntu in the future doesn't need Debian anymore? No. Um, I see. <laughs> I'm not sure that many people in Debian, or everybody in Debian, would share this view, but I see Ubuntu and Debian as two halves of the same coin. Um, um, I Technically, I think I still am a DD. Um, I certainly still think a lot about Debian and, as a project. I think it's a very important project. I think it does th you know, some things in a uniquely good way that we don't need to compete with or stress about, right? What I think about is that because of the way Debian does certain things, that because of things that make Debian really great, it will also naturally fall short in other areas. Now, that's not a criticism of Debian. It's simply saying that you make choices. You know, you say, look, we can be really great at this, or we can be really great at that. And so what I try to do is I think about what we can do in Ubuntu that's really complementary to Debian. So if you think about that, I, I, I see us as the other half of of the tr tree, you know, and think of it the roots and the branches. It'd be silly for the branches to say they don't need roots, right? And um, um, so at least that's very clear to me. I think it's clearer to me than it is to um, my counterparts in Debian, but that's okay. Um, you know, Snappy is a really useful new primitive, but our collaboration primitive inside Canonical, between Canonical and the community, and in most of the community, our collaboration primitive is still largely DEBs and will be for a long time. DEBs form a great way to make the core of the system. I think SNAPs parts, which are the source code definition pieces that go into SNAPs, are interesting new primitives as well, but we're not looking to substitute Debian away. There's no need to. It's a phenomenal project. I think we contribute a lot to Debian's success and vice versa. And I don't feel any tension in that at all. OK, uh, Ario is asking, will we see a partnership with Microsoft on getting the new Microsoft Office and Skype on Ubuntu, like it's available on Mac? Um, I really ha have enjoyed the collaboration that we have with Microsoft in the areas where we have it. Um, I think their Azure team is absolutely authentically focused on delivering a cloud that can run any workload, including any Linux. And they see Ubuntu quite naturally as, as a very important workload because it enables so much of the public cloud. Um, and it's a genuine, arms, you know, friendly, arm's length collaboration. And they're great guys. Um, I see that spreading to other parts of the company. But I'm also quite realistic. You know, uh, Something like um, Office is in a very different part of the organization that we don't have any real reason to to engage with, or they don't have any real reason to engage with with us at the moment. Um, so I wouldn't expect an artificial construct around that. Um, I think um, uh, uh, the fact that um, Google Docs is so central to um, um, our um, uh, workflows, for example, has really changed the game. I think the web is the new um, um, application delivery mechanism for a lot of this. I think the Chrome guys are exactly right um, in that. And so on that basis, I think the, the most important thing for us to focus on is being a great secure platform for personal computing with a great web capability. Um, uh, if there is a reason for us to work with Microsoft around um, Office, we'd be glad to do it. You know, um, uh, We have to be principled but not ideological. And there's a difference between those lines. Um, and uh, I think that would be very good for our users if it came up. But it's not going to happen 
just because we want it to happen. Um, it, there'll have to be some sort of trigger or driver or, 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 or rationale. Now, if we can establish a really great converged personal computing story and get some real market traction for that, then I bet they would do it in a heartbeat. And I think we'd do a great job of it and we would enjoy the collaboration. All right, and I think we've got time for one more, uh, which is from Mario Grip, and he's asking if we have any plans on removing the Android part of Ubuntu Touch. Um, yes, I mean it's a it's it's a slight awkwardness for us that that there is that, that it's not a, a, a clean stack effectively um, uh, using part of the Android kernel and driver stack effectively is necessary. It's an efficient way for us to get up and running. Um, I think it's really important for us to show that we can deliver a better end user experience, better security, um, um, uh, and a better experience for the device manufacturer if that's a clean stack, if it's essentially all open source and if it's um, all snaps effectively without that slight awkwardness. And the awkwardness isn't because it's Android. This is not a tri tribal thing. It's just because we have to integrate with something that itself is Im immovable, right? And that's that's a little tricky, or worse, which could move without us being aware that it might move. Um, so, so yes, hopefully that happens. Um, it's certainly not a piece that we love. I'm kind of grateful to Android that, that that piece is there at all, right? If you think about it, that gets us 99% of the way to where we need to be. Um, and I think the Android guys have done a great job of building that ecosystem. We, we couldn't do half the things we do today if it weren't for them. All right. Well, thank you, Mark, for taking time out of your uh, sprint this week to come do this Q&A with us. Uh, I want to thank questions. everybody. Yeah. Thanks, everyone on IRC for your questions. And uh, also thanks to Popey, who helped me uh, field all of these. Uh, if you didn't get your questions answered, uh, you can ask them any time on IRC. We've got a bunch of channels. We also have a specific convergence Q&A coming up in about five minutes. Uh, so if you have more questions, come there and you can ask them. All right. Thank you, Mark. It's groovy stuff. Stay well.